we've been going through Colossians chapter 3. And in this chapter, you might say Paul is exploring that whole area of being a new person in Christ. You know, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Uh, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, that's a, that, that's a radical statement. And so, what Paul is exploring in chapter 3 here is, how does that affect your life? What does that mean in your life? This this spiritual reality. And we saw, we've been seeing the verses 5 to 14. He's sort of like, it's taken off those old dirty clothes of our old life. You know, that worldliness, that world, the worldly ways, the worldly thinking, the, the worldly habits. And then putting on new clothes. Clothes that have been provided for us by Jesus Christ himself when he came into our life. In fact, uh, this is the way he puts it, you know. If you look back at verse 8, he said there, but, but now you yourselves are to put off, there it is, all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Since you, since you have put off the old man, those old clothes with his deeds. And then he says in verse 12 there, look at, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Put on, there it is, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And the cool thing about this is these are clothes in their fullness and meaning have been provided to us by Jesus Christ. When he came into our life, this is the spirit, this is the kind of life he has brought into us. And that's big. That's real big. Because he's not expecting you to go out there and do it all by yourself. He knows that old man just doesn't do these kind of things. And so... He said, I've given you new clothes. I am with you. I will help you. It's kind of interesting that he, he knows the nature of the beast. And so when he says, put on, that, in the, that, that verb is in uh, the, the, the present imperative. And the, and the idea of that is keep putting on. Put them back on. Put them on. Get in the habit of wearing them. And uh, it's like, this is, is the th it are the things that lead you into that new life that Jesus has for you. And when all is said and done, gang, that's the good life. That's the good life. You know, he says in, in Romans uh, 12, verse 2, he says, not being conformed to this world. That's taken off the old dirty clothes but being transformed by the renewing of your mind that's putting on the new clothes, that you might prove what, is, what the will of God is, that which is good and that's acceptable. It's perfect. So he says, this is what works. Now this brings us this morning to verse 15. And in verse 15 to 17, he adds three admonitions that will provide, I'll put it this way, will provide the, the, the framework for this new walk with Jesus. Uh, notice in verse 15, notice what he says. Number one, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Number two, look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then number three, look at verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Three admonitions, brethren, that really provide the catalyst in us that makes this whole thing work and work well in our lives. And I want to look at them this morning. I want to take a look at those three admonitions, what the Lord is telling us from them. And so he says, 
He says, first of all there, verse 15, number one, let the peace of God rule in your hearts in which also you were called in one body and be thankful. And so number one is be ruled by his peace. When you uh, receive Jesus into your heart, and I, I trust you have, you know, um, you've received his forgiveness for all of your sins. And you, because of him, now stand justified before God. Just, I, I love that word justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. And that's, and that's the way you stand before God now. You know, through Jesus Christ. Simply receiving him and receiving his forgiveness. That's like he says in Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore having been justified by faith, faith in Jesus. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That brings you to a place where you finally are at peace with God. You have peace with God. Oh, how wonderful that is. Peace with God. No more animosity between you and God. All that is erased. I like the way he puts it in Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. As a believer, if you're feeling condemned, that's not the Lord. That's coming from the pit. There's no condemnation because you now have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Isn't that an awesome thing? Just receive that. However, it's when we give him that rightful place of lordship in our lives that we have, we experience what he's talking about here. And that's the peace of God in your life. Oh, I remember, I remember in my life, <clears throat> I was a Christian, good card-carrying Christian, went to church faithfully. I believed. But I got this job down in Southern California in the aircraft industry when just before Joyce and I were married and just right after we were married, just right in the, that, that little period of my life. And I was a purchasing agent in an aircraft company down there. And uh, the bottom fell out of the aircraft industry. It was going through a real hard time. And I was a purchasing agent amongst three of us in the office there, in this office. And, uh, and boy, the, we were put under the pressure. And, and it, was, it, was, it, it was miserable going to work. I mean, just, just the pressure I felt. Vice presidents of the company would come in and hammer on my desk. Say, we need this part. We needed it yesterday. And uh, what, one thing I noticed was the guys I worked with, they, they weren't believers. I was. They weren't. But I was no different. The stress was killing me just like it was killing them. I was agonizing under it just like they were agonizing under it. It brought me to my knees before the Lord. I said, Lord, either this is a joke or I'm missing something here. It led me to understand. I'm going to share my testimony with the men on, uh, on February's breakfast. I'm going to share my testimony. <clears throat> but it brought me to that place where I realized the problem's here. And I, through a series of events, was brought to that place where I just utterly, totally surrendered my life to his lordship, asking the Holy Spirit to take over. I give it all. And you know what? That was the turning point in my life. I went back to that place and the next few months that I worked there, uh, I, I just had peace. I was filled with peace. Chaos was going on around me. And I had one of the, it really showed me one of the secretaries in our office came up to me sometime later and said, Brian, I don't get it. There's such chaos in this office and you always go around so calm. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. You know, Jesus said it, didn't he? 
He told his disciples in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In that same actual context, in chapter 16, verse 33, he said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And all I can say is that surrender to his lordship that was at the gut level, and it was meaningful, and it had no holds attached or anything. It just it was an utter surrender in inviting the Holy Spirit to be in charge of my life. I believe that was the day I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there was a peace that I had not experienced before. And now, Jesus, what he has said here is a peace that's really there. And it's from him. And gang, it's for us. It's for us, clearly. And you could ask yourself, well, how do you apply that in, you might say, those specific circumstances of life? Those things that come along and you come crashing in the back door to just rob you of peace. You know, how, do you, how, does, how does this apply to that? I think the Lord's given us the answer. You know, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. You know it, many of you. Be anxious for nothing. Don't be stressed out about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And here it is, here it is. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. What's he saying? Go to the Lord. Make your request before him. Here it is, here it is, here it is. Don't miss this part. And leave it, leave it in his loving and faithful hands. Because he loves you. And has guaranteed he will be faithful to you. Leave it with him. Years later, Joyce and I are ministering up here in Truckee. And we lived in a house, a nice big house in Sierra Meadows for 32 years. Raised our six kids in that house, you know, and sent them out. Then in 2008, when they, you know, uh, the economy went into the pit, uh, the fellow we had been renting this house from all these years, lost it and we got a knock on the door and saying I'm sorry you're gonna to have to move out you know we'll give you two weeks get out of the house and you know what <laughs> okay Lord I turn to you and I pray you will provide for me and Joyce now a place to live we've got to leave this has been our home and the kids were raised in for 32 years and so I give it to you. And to be honest with you, I'm kind of excited about where you're going to put us. I mean, what this is telling me is this great big house we don't need anymore. We raise the kids. They're out of the house and everything. It, it, it's time for something smaller. I, I, I accept that. It was so interesting. People would come to church and they heard that we had to get out of our house. And, oh, Brian, we feel so sorry for you. And in my heart, I'm, I'm thanking them for their, their empathy. I am. I'm very thankful for that empathy. But I wasn't feeling it. I'm going, let's see what the Lord's going to do here. I'm excited. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I gave it to him, and I didn't care where that was going to be. I had no requirements. I'm giving it to you, Lord. I'm handing it over to you, and I'm going to let you have it. And I know you're faithful, and I know you're loving, and I know you're wise. So wherever it is, wherever that turns out to be, Lord, I receive it as from you. This is what you have for me. Am I going to complain about what the Lord has for me? No, I am not. I'm going to be thankful for it. And all I can say is, you know, the Lord has been faithful, brethren. Here's the point, though. 
here's the point of Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It's like, turn to the Lord and give it over to Him completely and trust Him with it. He's your heavenly Father. And then, go ahead and be excited about what He's going to do with it. What He's going to handle. Brethren, that is how you experience and the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you've sat there and wrestled with that verse, Lord, I'm, I'm beseeching you, and I'm doing everything here, but I'm not experiencing that peace, Lord. <laughs> you haven't really Surrendered it to him and trusted him with it. I feel like it's yours, but I'm really nervous about this. Hey, you're not just trusting his faithfulness to you. My goodness, this thing is... Excuse me. I thought I had that taken care of. There we go. Anyway, here's what he's saying. He's saying, let that peace rule in your hearts. That's what he's saying. Rule in your hearts. Rule is the only time you find this word in the Greek in the New Testament. And it really carries the idea of, of being an arbitrator. You know, an ar arbiter. You know, let, let it arbitrate. In other words, let, let that peace be the umpire, be the arbiter when it comes to the, the, the conflicts and the issues of life that come along. You know, out of the annals of the Salvation Army, there's a story about a lady that uh, was known as Warrior Brown. And she was, um, <laughs> she was a lady who had a, a, a temper that you couldn't believe. And man, she could flare off like you could. And if she got to drink and watch out, man, she just, it was all over. And, and, and Warrior Brown came to Christ and gave her heart to the Lord through, you know, through folks in the Salvation Army. And, and she just felt like she was a new person, you know? One week later, she's on a street corner there with the Salvation Army gang, and she's sharing what Jesus has done in her life. Well, is she sharing that? Some scoffers threw a tomato at her and hit her the side of the head and bruised her head, stung her head, you know, and, and, and everybody's going, uh-oh, the old warrior brown man, that would have been it. You know, it would go, play right out there, man. It would have been all over. And she just looked down at that tomato, pot, uh, potato, and picked it up and put it in her pocket and acted like it never happened. And they're going, something's happened in that lady's life. You know, that's the peace of God ruling in your heart, isn't it? Listen to this. A few months later, they're having this harvest festival. And she brings the harvest festival uh, as an offering to the Lord, a sack of potatoes. <laughs> you get it, don't you? She took that, what she called insulting potato, chopped it up, planted it, and got a harvest of potatoes. And she brought those potatoes from that. And she said, here, it's my privilege to give to the Lord the increase of that insulting potato. You know? You know what the cool message is about that? That's just one little example. The cool message is God has guaranteed you as a child of his that he will not allow anything in your life unless he can bring a blessing out of it. Unless he can work it and make it, make it actually work out for good. He won't allow it. And so we have that confidence as believers. He promises that, doesn't he? Romans 8, 28, you know. God causes all things to work together for good. To love God and been called according to his purpose. Those whose faith is in Jesus. You know, um, I love what he says in Psalm 126, 5 and 6. 
those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So old Warrior Brown brought that sack of potatoes and said, here's the blessing out of that. You see? Ruled by his peace. His peace. Ruled by his peace in the area of decisions we make in life. I went and some years ago I did a wedding down in the valley. It was a couple that had been in our church. They met each other and and, uh, you know, got really saved in, in our church and moved down there. And so when they were getting married, they asked me to come and do the wedding. And so I went down there and do the wedding. It was a great little wedding we had in a park down there. But there was this young guy at the wedding that just was overflowing with the joy of the Lord. I mean, you know, I just a young man. He was just, he was just, he had the joy of the Lord written all over him. And when, so he and I sort of connected and we're just talking, you know, and everything. And I'm just enjoying this guy. And I'm asking, yeah, hey, tell me, I mean, tell me what's happened in your life. And, and this is kind of the part of the testimony that he shared with me that afternoon that I remembered. He was saying that, you know, he was in construction. He was, uh, he was a laborer, you know, a carpenter in, in construction. And he worked for a guy who had a lot of business, but the guy was awful to work for. Oh, he was, he was just, he was mean. He was demanding. Uh, he, he was often unfair and everything. And, but, you know, it was good work. And guys worked for him, but he was miserable to work for. Well, the way this guy would kind of, kind of get even, you might say, because he really, he really kissed up to this guy. He would steal some of his tools. Well, then the guy would just see red and get angry and start accusing everybody. But he never believed that this guy was the one stealing. He always thought it was one of, had to be one of the other guys. And he'd finally figure out who he thought it was and he'd fire the guy. This went on for quite a while. He was getting quite a store of really good tools. And then he gave his life to Jesus. And Jesus is now the Lord of his life. And he realizes, I've got to take these tools back and confess and give them back. He knew in his heart that's what he had to do. Hard to do it. Didn't know what was going to happen. He took those tools. It was, it was the Monday after the weekend he received Christ. And he took them back in his pickup truck. He went up to this boss. And, and he had worked for him for quite a while. And he confessed, I've been the one that's been taking those tools. And I've got them here and I'm returning them. Because, you know, I've received Christ now as my Lord and Savior. And I sincerely apologize. And I, I'm, I'm returning the tools to you. The boss flipped out in anger, fired him on the spot, and off he went. You know what he said? His heart was filled with peace. It was a hard decision, but it was the right decision. And he had peace. I had this wonderful peace and an inner joy. In the Lord. And wouldn't you know, the Lord provided even a better job. You see, let the peace of God rule in your heart. It'll help you make the right decisions in life that that ultimately come that, that, that blessing in life. Now, he adds there, let it rule in your hearts, um, in which you also were called in one body. He's talking about the body of Christ. He's talking about the fellowship of believers. He's talking about Christians in, in, the, in the church, you know? And he says, you've been called into that. And you know what he's saying? He is saying there that letting uh, the peace of God rule in your heart is especially important in the church. Especially important among brethren who believe in Christ. 
Paul, uh, Jesus said in, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called sons of God. You know why that's so important? I'll tell you why it's so important. Because there's an enemy out there, a spiritual enemy. We call him Satan and his gang. They're real. They're living. They're doing their stuff all over this world. And one of their goals is to divide and conquer in the body of Christ. You think they're not freaked out about a living body of Christ? They are. And they want to do everything they can to, 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 to cause division and, and, and tearing apart in the body of Christ. Brethren, that is spiritual warfare. I'm going to tell you something right now. That is why I'll hear from a lot of people. You know, I think the people in the world are a lot nicer than the people in the church. I have better friends in the world than I do in the church. It grieves me to hear that. But I'll tell you why. Because the enemy is after the church. Because there's a spiritual warfare going on there that is absent in the world. And that's why we're told, now hear this, we're told in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. I therefore, Paul says, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling to which you were called. Here it is, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, a whole bunch of patience, bearing with one another, Christian, in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Isn't that interesting that he calls us to endeavor to do that? It's not like, hey, just relax and hang in there and enjoy. Endeavor to keep that unity of the Spirit, which is glorious because it's, it's Jesus in his power in the bond of peace, you know? Blessed, Jesus said, are the peacemakers. They're called the sons of God. I love that. And so with that, you might say, the bow on the package is what he says at the end. And be thankful. Be thankful. 1 Thessalonians 4.18, you know, you know the verse, 5.18. 5, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything. What's God's will for my life? Be thankful. It's the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You know, um, remember what he said in Philippians 4, 6. Don't be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Don't leave out this part. With thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. You know why you can do it with thanksgiving? Because you're leaving it with, you're taking it to and leaving it with the one who is in ultimate control of everything. And he loves you. I like the way Charles Stanley, I heard Charles Stanley put it one time. He said this, he is in control of our circumstances regardless of who thinks they are. Don't you love that? <clears throat> and because of his promises to you, you can always be thankful in all things. Think of it. That attitude of gratitude, that, that attitude of thankfulness, it's what leads to a tranquil heart. Grumpiness, grumpiness leads to an agitated heart, doesn't it? That's just flat out common sense. So brothers and sisters in Christ who have been brought into an intimate relationship with your Lord and Savior who loves you with an unconditional and an everlasting love and has said, I am getting you to glory. And I'm with you on the, on the path to there. Brethren, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To which also you were called in one body and be thankful and so then the second thing, that's the first thing. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. 
The second thing is verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Be filled with his word. The word of Christ. Brethren, this is the word of Christ. Here it is. This book is about Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, it's about Christ. It is of Christ. The word of Christ. And his, his admonition there is, let it dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And you sit there and go, how do I do that? How do we do that? Get ready. This is a tough one. It starts with, listen, it starts with, here it is, here it is, don't miss it. It starts with reading it. Okay? That's where it begins. It's a living word. Read it. I know there's a lot of people out there, you know, I've tried that and, and I've got to be honest with you. I just don't get much out of it and, and it actually causes more questions than it does answers to me. Brethren, number one, it's not hard to understand. It really isn't. It's pretty straightforward. I like what I heard Mark Twain said, you know. He was your resident agnostic. He never believed as far as we know. He made this statement. <clears throat> Most people are bothered by those passages of Scripture which they cannot understand. But for me, I have always noticed that the passages in Scripture which trouble me the most are those which I do understand. <laughs> Years ago, a young lady, brand new in the Lord, gave me a call one night. <clears throat> and she was excited about being a Christian. But she said that very thing. I want to read the Bible. I want to be in the Bible. But I struggle with it. I struggle with reading it. I struggle with understanding it. And so I, I told her, her name was Terry. I said, Terry, um, you know what? The teacher of God's word is the Holy Spirit. You know, natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit or of the Lord. The teacher is the Holy Spirit. So Terry, I know you know the Lord, love the Lord, have received the Lord. <coughs> So before you open that book, every time before you open it, pray that the Holy Spirit will teach you what the Holy Spirit has for you out of his word. Not that you'll suddenly understand everything, but you will receive from the Lord through the word. Pray that. She was so young in the Lord. There was no yes, but. There was a, oh, oh yeah. Didn't even think of that. Thanks, Pastor Brian. It's in there. Hope it works. <laughs> Me of great faith. I saw her, you know, a week later. And she came up to me, bright-eyed, big smile on her face and said, made all the difference. How do you like that? That's pretty amazing. You know, I want to... That, that brings up the importance of the Holy Spirit in this admonition. You know what's interesting? He talks about results here, you know, singing, making melody in your heart and all that to the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, when he says, be filled with the Spirit, he describes the same kind of results. In verse 19, right after verse 18, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Does that sound familiar? There it is. You know, it's a, it's a result of being, being filled with the Spirit. It's interesting that when he gets into the armor of, of God, you know, against the, the, the attacks of the enemy in chapter 6 of Ephesians, he says, taking up the sword of the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit and His power. In there. Taking the sword, which is the Word of God, doesn't he? What a, you know, what a clear connection. <clears throat> so, again, it reminds me of that testimony I've alluded to in my own life here. At the same time that... I felt 
I, I saw a transformation in my own life. You know what else was transformed that was really interesting? And the only thing I can attribute it to is the power of the Holy Spirit. Before this, being the Christian that I was, I knew I should read the Bible. I knew I should be in it kind of on a regular basis. I wasn't doing very well at it, you know? I would be sitting on, you know, there in my room and everything, and, and maybe days at home, oh, yeah, I should spend some time in the Word. might read a little bit, you know? But it, was, it wasn't easy for me, and I wasn't doing very good at it. And then when I came to that point of letting the Holy Spirit have that place of total command and control of my life, as much as I've failed in many ways since then, but he's always in my heart had that place. One of, the, one of the most amazing results of that was before I had trouble reading the word, afterward I couldn't put it down. I kid you not. Couldn't put it down. Soaking it up. You know, his word. Brethren, there's a a real and a serious connection there. When he talks about letting it dwell, letting, letting the, the, the word of Christ dwell in your hearts richly. Brethren, that richly is when you come to his world yielded to the Holy Spirit. Oh, give the Holy Spirit that opportunity in your life on a regular basis. Yielded to the Holy Spirit. Read the word. Meditate on those passages. Commit passages to memory. But then, brethren, take it to heart. Receive it. And where applicable, apply it in your life. That, brethren, there's wisdom there. It's wisdom. Dwell in your heart richly in all wisdom. So you know what it comes down to, bottom line here? The bottom line in, this, in, in life choices and decisions is not, the bottom line is not, oh, I have a peace about this. That's not the bottom line. How many times I've heard young Christians say, we've decided to live together before we get married and we both have a peace about it. That's not the bottom line. The bottom line is the Word of God. The clear, objective Word of God is the bottom line. If you're going on the basis, well, this is what I feel good about. This is what I have a piece about, and so that's what I'm going to do now. You're cruising for a bruise, and it doesn't work that way. It reminds me, some of you will remember this story. It reminds me of when I was engaged to Joyce, and uh, we were going to be getting married in just a few months. And I went out and I bought a new car. Uh, it wasn't new. It was a used car. I mean, we got married in 70, February 70. And in that, that fall, I purchased a 66 Pontiac Tempest. Ooh, 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 ooh. nice car. I called this my, my honeymoon car. That's my honeymoon car. And I started preparing, saving up. I wasn't making very much money, about three, do, three bucks an hour. And, and, but but I, was, I was saving up so we could have a nice little honeymoon. Not an extravagant honeymoon, but just a nice little honeymoon. And I'm, so I'm crunching the numbers, right? I'm crunching the numbers seriously. How am I going to do this? How am I going to afford a nice little honeymoon, you know, and everything? And I had it all figured out. I think it was about three months. Might have been four, but I think it was three. If I didn't tithe for three months... I would have enough extra money to be able to have that nice honeymoon. I want you to know I even prayed about it. I gave it to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm sure you understand. I'm sure, you know, I, 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 I just feel that, that, that I have your blessing on this decision. It's just for three months, Lord. We were down half, halfway through that period. A friend of mine came knocking at my front door. I was still living with my folks at the time. I said, Brian, let's go down and park and play frisbee. I said, okay, let's go. So I ran out there. He had parked right behind my honeymoon car, which was parked on the side of the road. We jumped in the car. He backed up to go around my honeymoon car. And then we heard these squealing brakes 
on the road over here. And here came this car out of control across the road. And I saw it in slow motion. Smash into the back end of my beautiful little honeymoon car. I went there. Sweet folks. They were foreigners. New in the, in the country. But sweet folks. They didn't have any insurance. So I had to get my honeymoon car fixed. Here's the crux of the story. The deductible was exactly the amount I was saving by not tithing. Isn't that interesting? And we still had a nice little honeymoon. You know, brethren, here's, 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 here's the truth. The bottom line is, is let, let your life be guided and governed by the clear teaching of the word of God. You know, it's, it's the way of life. It's the truth. It's God gave it to us because it works. And I'm telling you, as he says right here, that's where there's wisdom. Right there. So, you know, <clears throat> let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And that's when he adds these, you know, these words. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. What you talking about there? He's talking about singing, isn't he? He's talking about sing your praises and worship to the Lord. Singing has always been a central part of the church and the worship of the church. It's not accidental that the longest book in your Bible, in the, virtually the middle of it, is the Psalms. That's the, that's the Psalter. That, that's the hymn book of the Bible. Those beautiful Psalms, you know? And brethren, that's why, that's why we spend a, a fair amount of time right at the beginning of this service just singing. Just singing to the Lord. I encourage you, sing with us. You know, Tertullian was, a, uh, was one of the church fathers way, way back. I think second century AD. He wrote this, talking about the body coming together, believers coming together. After water... For the hands, they would, you know, they would have a, a bowl of water there and they, people would be able to wash their hands when they came to the fellowship. And, and lights uh, have been brought in. Each is invited to sing to God in the presence of the others from his own heart. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Sing to the Lord. Aren't you glad we don't do that? But, <laughs> but brethren, 2,000 years of church history Every time there's been a revival in God's church, new songs have come with it. Singing has been a part of it. The Protestant Reformation in the 1500s was the first time that believers broke out of that, that you know, doxology type of, of singing to, the, to people getting together and singing. The very first hymns of the faith came out at that time. In a, in a hymn, in, in some of the, uh, the hymnals that are still used to this day, you'll find some written by Martin Luther. And then there was the Great Awakening, wasn't there? In this country, in the 1760s, the Great Awakening. The Wesleyan brothers were part of that. Charles, John Wesley, the, the evangelist, Charles Wesley, wrote a couple hundred hymns. And, and hymns filled, many of our old hymns come right out of that period where people singing, you know what they were doing? They were taking, they were taking tavern tunes and putting them to Christian words. Don't you like that? You know? And, and hymn singing. I think about most recently in my own life, the Jesus movement, which I had the blessed privilege of, of being a part of down there in Southern California. It swept the country but it was, you know, it was, it was big in Southern California. And you know what came out of that? New songs. Choruses. Spiritual songs. Taking the psalms and putting them to music. Very simple choruses. And it was out of that movement that 
really the modern contemporary Christian music has come out of. Wasn't known before that. And so there's always been, singing has always been a big part of worship. And that's, that's what he's telling us right here. He do it. Get in there and, and sing to the Lord. Our goal in worship is turning us, turning our attention to, to the Lord and giving him praise. That is so good for us. Giving him praise ministers to ourselves. And we do that together. And that's all the more encouraging and uplifting. Our corporate worship in song together ministers to one another. And that's exactly what he's talking about here. You know, he says, he says, teaching and admonishing one another. Well, I'm really not a teacher, and, and I don't know if I'm very good at admonishing. When we're singing together praises to the Lord, that's exactly what we're doing. And, and, and we are all together a part of that. And it it's glory, glorifies the Lord, and it's uplifting to the body of Christ, you know? Now, I know, I know, there are some of you that say, I can't sing. I just can't sing. You know, it's not in me. I'm just not a singer. I love that. I'll tell you what I think. When we get to glory, they're going to be in the front row singing the loudest. And here's good news. The Bible doesn't say, Sing melodious, in tune songs to the Lord. It says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. <laughs> I remember some years ago, my son Matt, who's a pastor now, <clears throat> we were sitting, we were over in the auditorium. We're sitting there, Matt's sitting right next to me. Matt, I don't know if it's changed now, but he couldn't hold a tune in a bucket. And he's stand, sitting we're right next to me, and we're singing, and he's singing totally off-key. I mean, you know, and I'm sitting there going, <clears throat> like this, and, and, you know, but he's singing out, and it blessed my heart. It blessed my heart to see this boy just singing out off-tune to the Lord. <laughs> he was making a joyful noise unto the Lord. <clears throat> so, brethren, look what he says here. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in your hearts, dwell, excuse me, dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, those are songs, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, singing with grace in your hearts, you know, that can carry the idea of thankfulness, rejoicing in your hearts to the Lord. So brethren, the word of Christ dwelling in, your, dwelling in you richly in all wisdom. And then thirdly, finally, here's the third thing. You've got, you've got the buttress to that walk with Jesus in those new clothes. Is being ruled by his peace, number one, and number two, being filled with his word. And then number three, verse 17. I love this verse. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Do everything. Let everything be done in his name. Whatever it is, let it be done in his name. What does that mean? What's he talking about? It's always being conscious of what you're really here for. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are, whatever you're talking about, let it ultimately be for his glory. You know, it's, it's, and he says, do it in his name. Dedicate it to him. Just dedicate whatever it is. Dedicate it to him. You know, um, I think that spirit right there, can make the most boring, mundane, irksome, miserable task enjoyable. You know what it's like? You know that, that the word right there? You know what it's like? It's like doing it as if Jesus Christ himself 
asked you to do that for him. This, Lord? Yeah. That. <clears throat> Story about a farmer's wife. Had sons, work crew. Those men were out in the fields all day long. And her job, she would fix three hearty meals a day for them. Right there in the kitchen. They would come in and, and, and she would have a, just a nice hearty meal ready for them. She had a plaque up in her kitchen. And it said this, divine services conducted three times a day. Amen. It's doing it in his name, isn't it? In that spirit, God gives it meaning. He gives it e eternal significance. He does. Whatever it is. Remember the story about Mary in her, in her jar of, of perfume that was extremely costly? And she wanted to do something for Jesus, you know. He and the disciples were at her house. And they were, you know, they were going to have dinner together and everything. And Mary wanted to do something. And, and she lived with her sister and her brother Lazarus. And, and she really didn't have anything much of her own, herself except this, this very, very expensive perfume. It was about a year's wages was the cost of that little pound of perfume. And she ran in and she grabbed that. And she ran out there to Jesus and she poured it on him. She poured the, she emptied the thing on him. Head, you know, feet, and just, just gave it to him. Well, number one, have you ever had dinner in, 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 in the presence of overwhelming perfume? You know? Number one, the Bible says the perfume filled the house with its scent. But you know what the disciples did? Mary... What in the world are you doing? That's a very, very expensive perfume. And look what you've done with it. You've wasted it. It was Judas who came to, uh, you know, came up and said, we could have sold that and really helped out a whole lot of poor people. And you just poured it, poured it out right there. And Jesus came to her defense. He shut them up. And he said, you'll always have the poor with you, but you won't always have me. And he gave, he gave it significance. He gave it spiritual significance. He gave it eternal significance. He said, she, she, has, buried, she has anointed me for my burial. And then you know what he said? He says, wherever the gospel goes in this world, people will remember what Mary did right here and right now. Boy, that's... That's significant. And so this is what he's saying in this verse. Christian, you're in that class, that group, that family, whatever it is. And there'll be a lot of people that says, well, that was stupid. That's the wrong thing at the wrong time. I can't tell you how many I've, times I've heard that as a pastor. <clears throat> Jesus will step in and because it's done in a spirit of, Lord, this is for you, he'll make it meaningful, eternally meaningful. Christian, don't ever feel, don't ever feel, man, what a waste of time. I have just wasted my time. You take that and do it and give it to the Lord in his name. And God says, I guarantee you, it's not a waste. That's our Lord. That's what he's saying when he says, whatever you do, in word or deed, do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a glorious way to go through life. And then, and then he adds there, giving thanks to God. There it is again, the Father through him. You know what that is? <laughs> do it in the name of, and giving thanks to God. It's thanking God that we can do whatever for him. We can actually do that 
for him, you know, and, and for his eternal purposes. And he accepts it. He accepts it as unto him. So, brethren, he's told you that. So, Christian, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So, brethren, there's the framework for those new clothes, wearing those new clothes, ruled by his peace, filled with his word, doing everything in his name. Boy, that's a heart for Jesus. It's as simple as that. And I wanted you to notice the undergirding attitude, consistent through that. He said there at the verse, the end of verse 15, and be thankful. He said at the end of verse 16, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You know, there's translations that translate that singing with thankfulness in your hearts to the Lord. And then verse, verse 17, um, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Is he trying to tell us something? You think? You know, there's an old theologian, an old German theologian, man. He goes way, way, way back. I don't want to tell you how far back he goes. But he said this. Listen to this. If the only prayer you said in your whole life was, thank you, that would suffice. So, brethren, listen. Be thankful. No matter what. Try it. Try it. <clears throat> so with that, you've been told about your new clothes. You've been told, you might say, the framework for those new clothes. This is how it works. Now, where is it really going to be put to the test? <laughs> you know, in the home. In the home. That's where it gets put to the test, you might say, first and foremost. It's not coincidental that now he goes on and he says, now with that, let's talk about the home. And so, brethren, the next two weeks after this, we're going to be looking at what he says about the Christian family. So, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Rejoice in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that we've had together in your word and in worship of you. And Father, we just pray now that as we go our separate ways, Lord, it won't be something that just gets, gets lost in the busyness of the day. But Father, a, a reality we can embrace in our life and in our walk and be encouraged in your faithfulness and your love to us. Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all of God's children said, Amen.